They're making the best choices when they're choosing which fish to eat. So methylmercury is what I'm looking at especially because um, while there's different species of mercury, methylmercury is what's accumulating in the top part of fish, and so you have most of your mercury being methylmercury in these fish. So statewide, the New York State Department of Health has issued um, one meal of lake trout just as a general rule for the lake trout um, in the Finger Lakes, although there are specific um, regulations for different lakes. Um, the US EPA has um, stated that there's a 300 nanogram per gram uh, for methylmercury for a guideline for consumption that's for humans. For wildlife, it's a little bit different. It's 160 nanograms per gram where you see adverse effects. Um, again, this is methylmercury. So methylmercury is dangerous because it can cause um, brain and nervous system impairment, and that's not just for humans, but it's also for other organisms. And you see this mostly in developmental stages where it's the most harmful, harmful although adults are affected as well. Okay, so when we're looking at mercury, um, most of it, safe to say, is coming from anthropogenic sources, although things like volcanoes can also cause mercury to get into the atmosphere. So once the mercury is in the atmosphere, um, it can interact with different water bodies. It can go into bogs or different um, watersheds. But once it reaches the sediments and it becomes methylized by sulfate-reducing bacteria, this is when it gets into the food chain um, and can really biomagnify up into um, the larger fish that we and the other wildlife eat. Okay, so the Finger Lakes. I'm from the Finger Lakes. I assume a lot of people in the room from the Finger Lakes, so they're really important to me. There's not that much um, out there right now for lake trout with um, and studies with mercury, so I thought it was a really good idea to do mercury in the Finger Lakes. Um, it's important, again, for tourism and for anglers, so we want to know these things about the lake trout if we're going to eat them. My hypotheses for my honors so far are pretty general. Um, we see these trends in like the Great Lakes, so I figured let's see if we also see them in the Finger Lakes. So that larger lake trout are going to have higher concentrations than smaller lake trout. Older lake trout, um, higher concentrations than younger lake trout, and then seeing if age is a better predictor or if size is a better predictor for concentrations. And then kind of to tie it all together, are we seeing these differences among lakes or within lakes or both? Um, so that's what I'm looking for. I chose five of the Finger Lakes. I chose Canandaigua, Cayuga, Seneca, Owasco, and Skinny Atlas Lakes. Um, they're different sizes, they're different um, trophic statuses, There's just, they have different things going on. So I thought that this would be a good example across the board of the Finger Lakes. For fish collection, um, we had the New York State DEC collect fish and gill nuts uh, alongside with John Faust at the FLCC. And then myself and colleagues also caught the remainder of the fish with rod and reel. Um, so that's how we got our fish. Uh, we took the fish in the field and at the lab at the Finger Lakes Institute. Um, and measured them and weighed them, we sexed them, and we looked to see if they were native or stocked. Um, since methylmercury accumulates in the muscle of the fish, we just took the right side of the fillet and we didn't homogenize it, we just took plugs. Um, the plugs were then freeze dried so we could run a dry sample through our machine. It was a little bit easier on the machine. Um, so this is just the lab, this is me cutting up one of the lake trout. Okay, so for mercury analysis, we use a direct mercury analyzer, so we don't have to do a digest or anything. We just take dry sample, we run it, um, and the machine kicks out a concentration. So all this work was done at the Finger Lakes um, Institute. We didn't outsource any of this work, we did it ourselves. Um, again, it's a fairly quick process, so you take about six minutes per sample, and then you're done, you have a concentration. For aging, you could either use scales or the orlith, but scales are really tricky with lake trout, so we chose to use orliths. Um, to remove them, we just took the, the gill plates out and then cracked the vertebrae and could find the orlith right behind. Again, these orliths are not easy to read either, so we outsourced to um, Kerjurka at Cornell University through Ecologic, um, who aged all of our orliths for us. Um, you can see that you really need someone that's a professional, that's trained, that can tell which annuli, which are the rings, um, and where they are, and what year they came from. So 
On the left there, the largemouth bass is pretty easy to read. You can see the annuli, you can see each year of life. But the lake trout on the right is really hard. It was not something I could do, so we had to, again, go to Kurt for that. Okay, so for our first hypothesis, we're looking at um, size of lake trout, um, seeing which size had the higher concentrations. Um, this is just our spread of data for sizes. Um, we had about 280 millimeters to like 750. So that's about 11 inches to 30 inches with fish. Um, and then it's kind of important to notice that if we're worried about um, human consumption, anything over 15 inches is what we worry about. So that's right around 380-ish. And then if we're worried about wildlife, which we are, we're also worried about the, um, the, lower, the lower section there. So we saw a nice linear regression with um, length weight, which we expected. That was good. Um, so then we got to um, our mercury, which is, I forgot to mention that we're measuring total mercury with our analyzer, um, but we're assuming that most of, almost 100% of that is methyl mercury. So this is total mercury. Um, what we see is that there is a significant relationship between um, methyl mercury, or with mercury and length. Um, and then you can also see that they're above the 300 nanogram per gram, which is what the EPA is suggesting. Um, we have 40% of our samples above that. So that's you know, a lot of our samples that are above that guideline. So this is what we saw for statistics. Um, Skinny Atlas and Canandaigua both did not have a significance with length and mercury, and we are assuming this is because we have a really low sample size for Skinny Atlas, and in Canandaigua, all the fish were basically the same size. So there wasn't really a range there. But um, with all lakes, there was, um, when we combined all lakes, there was significance. Um, my next hypothesis was age. So um, you can see here that we have a wide um, range of ages. And we did find significance across all lakes, but with individual lakes, we didn't find any significance. Um, again, we had a small sample size. Um, this is something that we have to work for next time we do this research, is just having a larger sample size. Um, so then, again, there's your 300 nanograms per gram with the 40% of fish above. Um, so yeah, here we go. This, we didn't find significance within lakes, um, but when we combined all the lakes together, we did. We still have more fish to age for Seneca Lake. We haven't aged all the fish yet. So we'll see what happens when we age those fish. Um, just to conclude with those results, we found significance with length and weight um, within and among, or with all lakes. Age, we did not within, but we did with all lakes combined. We also looked at condition, sex, and then I don't have it on here, but we looked at um, the difference between stocked and native as well. So condition within lake, there was no significance, but with all lakes there was. With sex, there was no relationship whatsoever, not within or with all lakes. And then there wasn't either for stock versus native. So when we're comparing the lakes um, to see the differences, we had to standardize for length because we did have you know, a big array of different um, sizes. So when we standardized, we saw that um, Owasco, Canandaigua, and Seneca were similar to each other, while Cayuga and Skinny Alice were different from those three. So that was kind of interesting. Um, this is what we ran for those. Kind of to sum it up here in the discussion is that we're seeing that 40% of the fish that we collected were over the 300 nanograms per gram um, for that consumption guideline by the EPA, and which is also um, farther above the 160 nanograms per gram for wildlife. So there is something we have to watch out for for mercury. Um, it's not alarming, but it's something that we have to be aware of. Um, as far as the variation among the different lakes um, and where we see the different mercury levels, <coughs> there could be a few reasons for this. One of them is the food web dynamics. So some lakes have invasive species, like Cayuga has hemimysis, Seneca, I mean, excuse me, Seneca has hemimysis, Cayuga has um, goby, there's an absence of quaggas and Owasco, so these differences in food webs might be causing differences in mercury um, in the lake trout. We're not sure we're looking into that. We're also looking at land use. So some lakes have a lot of agricultural land use around them, and some have a lot of forested. So if you have a lot of agriculture around places like Owasco, you have a lot more nutrient inputs, um, which can cause eutrophication. Um, 
which has a whole host of different reasons why you might have more mercury. Um, or if you have more forested and you have less nutrients coming in, it's more of a ligotrophic lake. Again, there's reasons why you could have higher or lower mercury in those systems. Um, we're also looking at catchment area to lake area. So if you have a really large lake with a small catchment area, there's less sources where you're gonna get those inputs of mercury. And vice versa, where you have a really small, like a really large catchment um, zone. So that's what we're looking at. And I would put this all into context. There is a study done from 1988 to 2008 with lake trout and mercury. Um, what we found was that in Seneca Lake specifically, we had the highest sample size. So we had 17 fish, which ranged from seven years old to 15 years old. Our mean was lower than all of the other years. So this is telling us right now that, at least in our samples, mercury is lower um, than it was in the past. So our minimum, um, you know, it was right around 250, and that was in on an eight-year-old fish. Um, that mean is around 380. So again, it's still over the 300 nanograms per gram. And then this is kind of our flyer. We have um, right around 700 nanograms per gram um, in our maximum fish, but it hasn't been aged yet. So we don't know how old this fish is. So that's just kind of where we stand right now with past results um, and seeing where the mercury is at. So I'd like to thank Lisa Kleckner and Roxanne Rizavi at the FLI. They've helped me with everything. They have provided me with the space to work, helped me with statistical analysis, with running the actual fish. Um, Megan Brown, who's my <coughs> advisor at Hobart, um, I'd like to thank her. And then my funding, which is coming from Hobart William Smith, the Honors Committee, um, and then John Faust at the Finger Lakes Community College in New York, DC for fish collection, and then a host of my friends and colleagues. for a few questions. Is there any literature that you've seen that discusses the difference between what the component methyl mercury and the total mercury uh, measurements? I mean, how much is it to 80%? Is it We're assuming that most of it is around 100% of methyl mercury in the top part of fish just because it's the organic. Um, I have not specifically read those. I know that my Workers have, so I'm not sure, but I know that it's. We're assuming that in the top part of fish, like in lake trout, that almost 100% of the mercury is not old. So I, I don't remember when, when the study was done. It may have been like 2008, 2009. Um, it, there was some. I don't. I don't know what agency, so it might not be totally useful. But they uh, they were doing core. They were doing sediment analysis cores of uh, of, of, of Cayuga Lake. I think Seneca Lake and a, and a couple of other big finger lakes. And it was it was very interesting. We were, I was looking at it to try and get a historical perspective on, you know, what the how the land use was, was affecting the the water quality over time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with that study, but it was it, you know it, it might it might be interesting. It's I used, to, I used to bring it up every once in a while, and no one seemed to know that it got done. It was a big huge thing that all this money got spent on, and people just never really pointed to it. But it was a, but it was a great uh, sediment core analysis of of the Finger Lakes region. And it was like 2008, 2009. I don't know if that has any application to your project or not. Right. Yeah. No. I'll look into that. The land use that I'm using right now is coming from John Halfman at Omar Wayne Smith. So I just look at the land use around. I haven't looked at any sediment cores. So that's something. Yeah. It was super. It was super interesting to read. It was. It was. And it was, and it was thick. So right. it had a lot of information in it. Yeah, so that same study had a lot given, I believe. Um, we just chose Seneca because it had the most um, sample size for us. Um, I mean, right now, we're looking at Alaska having some of the highest numbers, but we're also seeing them with the oldest and largest fish in our sample size. So that's just what we collected during the summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're now at our break. Um, we will resume uh, at 10 minutes after 10, and at that time all the two sessions will be running concurrently again. Thank you everybody for bearing with uh, the morning. <laughs>